Yeah, I have a few announcements. Uh, I want to bring from Al and Jeannie Weeks and John DeCesar from Port Orange, Florida. Uh, if you could keep Arlene Bean in prayer, for those of us uh, who have known her uh, for years. Uh, she had to be brought to the hospital today for a severe bird. So, uh, Ask for your prayers for her. Uh, Timmy uh, would like uh, all articles associated with the newsletter to be in in two weeks. Uh, an elder meeting meet tomorrow night at 6.30. And the ladies meet will be next Saturday at 10.30. And Brother Kurt has uh, announced he would like to become a voting member. So if our recording secretary could uh, make a note. And that's wonderful news. Brother Kurt. And we're going to stand and open up with 199. 199. Reading and love. of that hymn, Father, of that redeeming love that uh, was sent from heaven for us, that uh, we might be brought back to you in a relationship that had been severed at the Garden of Eden. And we thank you for the, the love that Jesus showed for us by willing to give his life for us. And so, Father, to that end, uh, we, we can never say enough thanks, we can never give enough worship. Uh, uh, to, enable us to be able to reflect that gift to us. And so as we enter this season, Father, we remember his birth. We just uh, celebrate his life on this earth and the words that he spoke and the life that he lived, pure and sinless. And, and, uh, and he's asked us to follow in his footsteps. And so as we walk this pilgrim way, may you uh, strengthen us in our faith and in the power of the Spirit, Father. 
uh, continue to, to show the world that we are his disciples and lights in this dark and dying world. Father, uh, thank you for each head that is bowed here. May you bless each with uh, your grace and mercies and, uh, and the power of your spirit as, as we worship together in spirit and in truth. Uh, bless our singing, our prayers, our readings, and, and, uh, and the breaking of your holy word uh, this morning that the things that you put on our brother Bruce's heart to share, Father, that you will edify and uplift us in the most holy faith and remind us again of the truth of your word. We thank you, we praise you, we leave this in your care and in your keeping. Uh, and we pray, Father, for Arlene Bean, uh, uh, who was brought before us, Father. Uh, may you be with her and the doctors who were treating her and, uh, and restore her back uh, to her family, Father, and, and to, her, to her home. And, uh, and there's so many others on our, in our hearts, Father, that uh, are, we are mindful of. We would ask that your grace and mercies be with them, especially for those who are not here today for whatever reason. Uh, may you be with them. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 632. He's everything to me. Is he everything to you? Yes. yes. That should have been a big resounding yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. 
Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed to all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. A man invited a friend to his church. After the service, his friend said, I like the songs and the atmosphere, but I don't get it. Why do you give Jesus such a high place of honor? <clears throat> the man then explained to him that Christianity is a relationship with Christ. Without him, Christianity would be meaningless. It's because of what Jesus has done in our lives that we meet together and we praise him. So who is Jesus and what has he done? The Apostle Paul answered this question in Colossians 1. No one has seen God, but Jesus came to reflect and to reveal him. Jesus, the Son of God, came to die for us and free us from sin. Sin has separated us from God's holiness, so peace could only be made through someone perfect. That was Jesus. In other words, Jesus has given us what no one else could, access to God and eternal life. Why does he deserve such a place of honor? He conquered death. He won our hearts by his love and sacrifice, and he gives us new strength every day. He is everything to us. We give him the glory because he deserves it. We lift him up because that is his rightful place. So let's give him the highest place in our hearts today and every day. Good morning, again. That's quite a statement. He is our all in all. He is everything to us. When we stop and think about it, that means that anything else in our lives takes a lesser position, a lesser focus than he does. So that puts everything that we do into perspective. My all in all, you are my strength, oh God. You are the one on whom I call. <clears throat> Let's rise and sing this together.
will say amen. 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 chance your first thoughts of fasting go to food and not eating as were mine then I think our considerations today will be very enlightening to you uh, just as it has been to me our brother Richard Robert affectionately known as Richard II around here has offered this for our considerations fasting in Mark 2.19 and Luke 5.34 and Matthew 9.15 all state that after the bridegroom, which is Jesus, is taken away, then his followers will fast. Should we fast? And how do we do it? And when should we fast? And that's from Brother Richard. I will state the obvious, we at CBF are eaters. <laughs> We're very good eaters. 
prior to the shutdowns, we were very regular in fellowshipping all around food. And we are on our way back to that regularity. And uh, Lord willing, it will continue. As we will see, eating has little to do with fasting and purpose. It is not a punishment. It is not a great suffering sacrifice made to God or required by God. To fast is for our benefit, to bring us closer to God. One commentator said, fasting helps us detach from the world, then our prayers reattaches to God. Let us go to uh, the Matthew 9 account. If you've got your Bibles with you, we'll open it up. We're going to be in Matthew, right around chapter 9. Starting at verse 10. Starting at first time, we see that Jesus sits down to eat, and he's joined by many, you know, those tax collectors and those sinners ugh, who join him and his disciples. And in disgust, the Pharisees see this. So they ask uh, Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with, you know, tax collectors and sinners? And then we pick up at, at, at verse 12. When Jesus heard that, he says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, sinners to repentance. And after hearing Jesus' response, the disciples of John the Baptist come up. And uh, then the disciples of John came to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast so often, but your disciples do not fast? What gives here? First, I'd like to point out that to fast was a regular occurrence and habit with uh, the Jews of Jesus' time. And as we will see when we consider when should we fast, um, we'll see that more. It was noticeably out of the ordinary for Jesus' disciples to not be regularly fasting as the other Jews did. You know, the good, those would be the good Jews, you know, not the sinners and the tax collectors, you know. So Jesus gives this answer. He says to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. So Jesus explains, although probably few understood at that time, that the mourning, which often accompanied fasting, was a, and was a big part of their, their fasting ritual, it is put on hold as long as Jesus is with the disciples while the bridegroom was with them. There was nothing to mourn about. The groom was with them. So has the bridegroom been taken away? Has the bridegroom been taken away? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are we still waiting for his return? Yes. Anxiously awaiting, are we not? 
and then they will fast. So while we are in waiting for the Lord to return, they will be, they will fast. Thus, Brother Richard's question is, should we fast? What, is, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Tim, if you have the mics ready, anyone want to make a comment to the question of should we fast? I'm not asking you, do you fast? <laughs> should we fast? Okay, well, let, let, let's continue. It will be important uh, to our consideration to hear the rest of Jesus' reply. Many Bible versions kind of split verses 16 and 17 off as a separate teaching or parable as it applies to many of our New Testament teachings regarding the law and particularly the way the uh, Pharisees and, and enforced them and added to them, I might add. So would someone please read for us Matthew 9, verses 16 and 17. Thank you, Sherry. Matthew 9, uh, 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. no, one, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and the worst tear is made. Neither is a new wine put into an old wine skin, otherwise the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. Okay, thank you, Sherry. So, what's this all about? Does it have anything to do with fasting? Or what do these verses pertain to? Anyone want to answer? Steve, thank you. You know, I'm going to say it pertains to the Holy Spirit and to, you know, us accepting and looking unto Christ. For we cannot, as we become a, a, a new creation, or in, I think in this way what it is, is Christ can be looked at as the patch for our hearts and everything that's going on. But you, you can't sow new to old. We have to become new, and the only way to become new is through Christ. And then you sew a new patch onto a, onto a new clothing, or you put new wine into a new wineskin. I believe this is a reference to the Holy Spirit and to, to us and to accepting Christ. Okay. Anyone else? Let's consider this. Under the law, there were a bunch of thou shalt, thou shalt not, that were to be kept to the letter of the law. The letter of the law to earn life, which no man ever could do. For no one can be saved or made righteous by keeping the law. Paul tells us there is none righteous, not even. Let me suggest to you that this is the old garment or the old wineskin, the law covenant. The wine is the com commandments, the word of God and the will of God for mankind. The law is perfect. The problem with the law is man man is unperfect and could never keep it. Let me suggest to you the new wineskin is, is that which we've received from Jesus Christ, the new covenant. Matthew 26, 26, verses 26 to 28 says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. You know these very well. We go over this every, every spring. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. What's in the cup? Wine. Wine. Then he took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There's a new sheriff in town, or a better, a new king. And a new way of keeping God's commandments and keeping God, the will of God. It is no longer a bunch of thou shalt nots to be kept by hearts of stone and stiff-necked people, because they have to. Those who come and drink of the blood of Jesus Christ and the new covenant swap their hearts of stone for hearts of flesh. Which Steve was referring to. They are given salvation, given life eternal, and freed from the constraints of the letter of the law. Free to do as much good as they possibly can do. They no longer live tethered and dependent to keep the letter of the law and keep the letter of the Pharisees' interpretations of the law and additions to try and earn life. They are now to live in the grace of God, free in Christ to do good. The old wineskin cannot hold and accommodate the great expansion of liberty given in Jesus Christ by the grace of God. Thus, the precious wine of God's will is put in a new wineskin. A new way that can expand, loose the constraints that hold back the doing of good to allow us to love thy neighbor as thyself unencumbered. You remember when Jesus healed on the Sabbath? The law says he couldn't. Okay. That's taken away. We are unencumbered to do as much good as we can do. The law of covenant could not expand to allow the liberty in Christ without bursting. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. The commandments of God do not spoil under the new covenant. They expand. Liberty in Christ expands. There was no liberty under the law. The law was the law. The new wineskin is the new covenant in Christ's blood shed for you. A life lived in full dependence upon the grace of God and his free gift, faith in Jesus Christ. So for those whose first question is, is fasting required? Do I have to? The answer is no. We are not commanded to fast. But the far more important question is Brother Richard's first question. Should we fast? Should we? What are your thoughts? Anyone want to make a comment? Brother Steve? Um, hope I didn't jump ahead of you a little bit when I was uh, reading Matthew and um, when Jesus said, go and learn this. Is, uh, he is uh, referring back to Hosea in uh, chapter 6. And uh, in the quote where Jesus said, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you could put um, fasting as a personal sacrifice. And it's not a commandment, mm -hmm. but I believe that it is a personal sacrifice that is to each person. If they choose to um, do that, if it brings them closer to the Lord, or if they're mm -hmm. struggling with something, or if there's something that they feel that they need to kind of try and put 
a sacrifice in place that keeps them for a certain amount of time focused on a, a certain prayer or something that's going on with them. That I don't, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a commandment by no means, but uh, it is a type of a sacrifice, and I believe it's a it's a personal sacrifice. Yeah. Now, the, the Pharisees tried to, as we know, what they tried to do is they tried to put burdens on everyone, as if, you know, we are fully in charge of your life. It's absolutely right, and we're we're, we're that, that exactly is where we're going here as to whether it is required or whether we should. It's a personal thing. It's about your personal relationship with, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ and with, with our Heavenly Father. Okay. In Jesus' sermon, any, anybody else? Yes, Sherry? Uh, use the mic, please. I just had a question about, um, aren't there churches that do um, fast and it's near Easter, usually? Churches that do? Fast. Yeah. Around Easter time. Is that a thing or am I? Some have, have rituals. Yeah. 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 And, and, and as, as, we, as we go through this, and we're going to look at when, when should we fast, yeah. okay? okay. Um, and and like, we will... Like Lent. Like what? Lent. L-E-N-T. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we're going we're gonna to look at, 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 at why um, they did lots of fasting in the Old Testament. We're going to look at at the things that they fasted for, okay? And we're going, going to look at, and it's not just an Old, an old Testament thing. It, 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 it's, there's a lot of it in the New Testament, okay? And we're gonna look at, 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 at reasons that, that we might, but it's still going to come down to a personal thing for you. We talk about the liberty that, that, is, that is in Christ, okay? So probably most of that will be um, answered next week, but uh, we, 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 will, we will definitely get to it. And, and, and you know, rituals and, 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 and whatnot didn't stop with, with the Jews, okay? We, and and we, we have several of our own in, in this church that we keep. There's nothing wrong with them. Okay, but when we start looking at, 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 at why and how um, we should fast, matter of fact, let's, let's go to that now. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he gives us some instructions on how we are to fast. If you just go back a couple chapters to Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18, goes, uh, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, Jesus says, with a sad countenance, with a sad face, for they disfigure their faces so they may be, so they may appear to men to be fasting. Make sure everybody knows, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. They're not like those tax Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father, who is in the secret place. And your Father, who sees um, in secret, will reward you openly. I want to point particularly to the fact that is this not the Lord fully expecting that his disciples are or will be when he leaves fasting and this these verses here twice he says not if you fast but he says when you fast 
When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. Again, Steve's point about this being a personal uh, sacrifice or, or a, a personal coming to God. Okay? We are called to seek God by following Jesus Christ, and we choose to accept that calling and allow God to do his work in transforming us sinners into the likeness of Jesus Christ. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives, we are given a heart of flesh for the heart of stone. We are not given the long list of thou shalt not and daily rituals to be kept perfectly and thereby earn our salvation. We receive a heart that realizes and appreciates the ransom that has been paid to redeem us back to God. And we're given the power to do the things that please God. If this is true in our lives, then we do not need to be told and required to do things that please our Heavenly Father. Things that honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do not need a bunch of written laws because we seek to know what, pleasure, what pleases God. And we have one law, the royal law of love. If someone would go to Matthew 22, Matthew chapter 22 and read verses 37 to 40, please. Faye, thank you. 37 to 40? Please, yes. And he said to them, you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like, like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Thank you. James calls this a royal law because it's given to us by the king of the kingdom in which we reside. With a new heart and Holy Spirit of God to lead us, we can keep all the laws and far, far more by fulfilling these two commandments. We do not need a commandment to require us to tithe a certain percent of our blessings. It is enough to know for our own good that we always be reminded from whom all these blessings that we have come and to whom we have pledged them. We have pledged not 10% but we have pledged them, pledged them all. We pledge all our things, all our lives. We don't cry and whine about being required to give 10%. We freely and gladly rejoice to give the first and best of what we have been given back. Back to help support the spreading of the gospel, to help supporting God's house. while we please our Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus. It is between you and the Lord how much and to whom you give. We do not need to be required to be baptized. We see the example of our Lord, whom we, call, whom we are called to follow. We know what those whom receive the first fruits of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost we know what they were responding to. It was when Peter said, repent and be baptized. We know the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I received my first shot of the Holy Spirit unquestionably about a month or so before I was baptized. Was I 
still required to be baptized? I had no idea. But I did understand Jesus was baptized. And all that I read, the followers of Jesus were told first thing to be baptized. And I was committed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I certainly wasn't going to question or refuse his first commandment and follow me. Is baptism required? <coughs> no, but it is necessary. If you are going to be a follower of Jesus, I did not know if it was required, but I did know I should be baptized. You know, they say the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, which for the Christian, the disciple, the follower of Jesus, is accepting Jesus Christ as our needed Savior. And the second step, if you are to continue your walk in Jesus, is to be baptized. Then we still have a thousand miles, less two steps to go. And if we keep following in Jesus' footsteps, God will complete our journey and the work he has started in us. He will do it. Is tithing required? Is baptism required? Is fasting required? Our real question should be, should we tithe? Should we be baptized? Should we fast? Out of our love for the Father and appreciation for the sacrifice of Jesus' blood of the new covenant under which we live, we should be doing whatever we see that we should do. All right? The decision is still yours. Ask yourself, should I, should I fast? Cindy? We do have the Ten Commandments as well, and fasting is not there, but those are things that we are to follow. If they were there, then we would have to do them? If fasting was, was fasting. the 11th, would we have to do it? Not if, no. We do not. But most of the commandments are, are really solid things in life that we should not do. Okay. And he did give us those commandments. Okay. The, the, again, we're talking different because what we have to do, <coughs> under the law, they had to do that. Okay. Whether they wanted to do it or cared to do it or not, all right, they did it because they, they had to. Okay. We're going to get in a few minutes here um, a look about worshiping God and, and uh, spirit and in truth and maybe it'll, that'll come a little closer to that but we want, we want we keep these things because we want to do them okay that's the difference between having to do it and desiring to do it Um, we were going to stop here. For any any other any comments or, or or questions? Okay. Now I won't be so presumptuous presumptuous as to assume whether you fast or not. If you do fast regularly and do it right, as we read, I will never know unless you tell me. It is a private thing between you and God, as are your prayers. It is to be done in secret, not for everyone else to see, but between you and God. It is to be done seriously, and it is to be done with purpose. 
it is not about food and eating, but about disconnecting from this world. Disconnecting from the constant buzz and mental stimulation that is constantly, unceasingly pounding at us every waking moment. Amen. Be still and know that I am God. Is that really possible in today's world? Mm -hmm. If you doubt it, or are not sure, or have not experienced it in a long time, then this study is for you. I will confess. I, ne I, I had never taken fasting seriously. I love to eat, obviously. I don't recall ever fasting, although in my earliest days with Christ, I was very much into proving myself and my willingness to sacrifice to show myself worthy and to show what a great choice God had made when he chose me. So I don't remember it, but if Sherry says that I didn't eat for a day or two, once or twice, I, I wouldn't dispute it. This I do know. If I did, I'm sure it wasn't for the correct reasons. I should also let you know that God has been prepping me for this for nearly a year. Or maybe even 40 years. I can be a very slow learner sometimes on some things. I began dieting again, again, after last Thanksgiving. As I get older, I've learned that uh, it is much easier to diet November and December than to work off the 10 pounds, which I typically would put on between Thanksgiving and New Year's. For physical health reasons, I have stuck with the dieting this year and have almost always kept walking and exercising, at least somewhat, even when I wasn't dieting. I've been bothered for a couple of years now, but this spring it really got my attention that my prayer life was not what it should be. It seems that Brother Dennis has been emphasizing more and more, starting when I started noticing back this spring about prayer and his prayer habits and his prayer discipline. Maybe he wasn't talking about it more, maybe I was just <coughs> listening better. But in any case, I wasn't doing well with my prayer life and I was hearing it. The Lord's probably saying it's about time. I was doing my duty. I was doing my duty. I was doing my reading. I was sort of praying. But it wasn't right. It wasn't right. I don't know how to text, but probably if I did, I probably would have texted my to-do list for each day and texted it to the Lord. Oh yeah, ditto, yet, ditto yesterday. It doesn't take an elder to recognize that this is not good. Two verses kept haunting me. Be still and know that I am God. And then Revelations 2, 2 through 5. This begins so well. Jesus Christ speaking, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and, and are not, 
and have found them to be liars, and you have pers pre persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I feel pretty good. That kind of describes me pretty, pretty well. I'm working on that. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. I can see myself pretty easily in verses 2 and 3. Maybe save the have patience part. But then could verses 4 and 5 be me too? Have I, let, have I left my first love? Absurd. Absurd. Look at all the items listed in verses 2 and 3 that might be applicable to me. I'm constantly pointing you all to the head of our church, Jesus Christ. I never forget what Jesus has done for me and that apart from me, I am nothing. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. I'm constantly reminding us that we are not to be led around by our feelings, but to be led by what we know from the Word of God. Not what you feel, what you know. You ever heard me say that? Knowing the Word of God, dedication, duty, obedience are all good and proofs of the true disciples and followers of our Lord, but they must never become a substitute, a stand-in for the fervent love for the Savior that I had at first. That fire in the belly that woke me up every morning and drove me to my knees and that precious word of God and my Lord Jesus Christ. Did I outgrow it? Did I become satisfied with what little I know? Did I leave my first love for the love of the work in serving his cause as opposed to loving him? Or am I too old? Oops. Sorry, Dennis. I mean, too mature. <laughs> am I too mature to have that fire I once had? Matthew 18, 3 and 4. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will, be no, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. As we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, we must retain, as little children, our love and our humility, our desire to know and do more. So my prayer this spring was, how do I get the fire and energy back? There's something missing. I, I, I don't have that joy in, 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 in go get it. Not thinking or realizing that what I was really asking for was how do I get back to my first love? Fear not. I'm not lost yet. I haven't forgotten that Brother Richard's question is on fasting. So back to my diet. This is where I am. Back to my diet. 
I've been several months into it and getting very bored when I read a Google article that catches my attention about intermittent fasting, <laughs> which many were saying they were doing with great, with great results. I've done all right with it. I've not seen great results, but just to tell you quickly what it is, you go 18 hours without eating, and then you do all your eating for the day in six hours. And I'm not going to go through all what's, what is, what's supposed to be going on with you, okay? Because this isn't about eating. So this I, I, I move to, and, and, and that's what I'm doing when we get to Brother Richard's question comes through, should we fast? Although the question was distributed to Brother Dennis, it was a good one, and, and I'm thinking, well, I should probably consider this seriously for the first time. Did I mention I like to eat? <laughs> well, we will look at many of the scriptures in the Old Testament and the purposes for which uh, they would fast and pray when we answer the question, when should we pray? Should we think that to fast was just an Old Testament thing, we will see there are many instances in the New Testament where fasting and prayer was indeed done for, for similar reasons. This isn't anything I, I want to hear your answer, but I want you to think about. Have you ever found yourself falling to sleep when you pray before you have a chance to receive an answer? Find yourself being very repetitious and blasting through your to-do list for God, things for God to do for you. Have you ever been glad that, oh, I remembered to pray, good, and glad it was over? Have you ever found yourself praying to God and thinking about what you need to do next? If so, you may want to con consider one of the three types of fasting found in the Bible. Again, let me state that the fast is not about dieting or eating. It is about being able to give our time and attention to God. To block out the noise and the concerns of this world and to focus on the spiritual realm where we must be to meet God. You will recall Jesus tells the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 verses 22 to 23. He says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Fasting because we are required to, because we must, is not seeking and worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. Nor is it in the liberty that we have in Christ. Fasting because we desire to be closer to God. To be cut off from the hustle and bustle of this world of earthly living. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who <coughs> worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. I have found that fasting helps me greatly cut off from the world. I have found that when I fast, the fire in the belly 
I seek for my first love begins as a hunger of another sort. But that hunger reminds me of what I'm truly hungry for. The time I might spend preparing, eating, a little time cleaning up, I can spend in quiet time with the Lord, with our Heavenly Father, reading and or studying, contemplating on my first love, my true hunger, or with my full belly, I can watch the next news flash on TV, read about the Bruins, how they did last night, the Patriots aren't a big interference anymore. <laughs> when I come home from one of my two days of working and I need to exercise, I must go in, change, and get to it. If I stop and eat first, I sit in my chair, and I fall asleep. <clears throat> if I'm hungry, I can exercise, I can read, I can pray, I can do all things without falling to sleep. All the world's cares and thoughts are replaced by the fire and hunger in the belly. If your purpose in the fast is to get in contact with God, you will have no problem remembering what you want to do when your belly is constantly growling and drowning out the cares of the world. Questions? Comments? I'm not telling you you need, you have to fast, but I am suggesting that you could give it a try. It, it, it's been very helpful to me. Yes, Justin. My question is, uh, there have been times to where I would be at work and uh, working in construction can, can be very labor, a labor sometimes, but uh, there have been days to where I'm trying to get something done, trying to accomplish uh, that day's work and I would work through lunch and I would tell myself that um, I don't need food to to keep on going but I would also um, remember that through the Holy Spirit um, I can uh, Christ will strengthen me no matter what and through him I can get today done would you consider that to be a form of fasting or would it just be just trying to get that day's work done um well, well, we'll look at some of the hows next week, um, Lord willing. We're, we're going to look at how do, how, how do we fast and when should we fast. And if we have time, is, is fasting just an individual activity? Okay. So if you still have that question after next week, bring it back up, up, up again, all right? Will do, brother. Any others? Yes, Brother Steve. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment. When, uh, you were, uh, when Cindy asked her question, you were talking about that, saying, you know, is it, uh, is it required? Just as a reminder to us that uh, true love comes with a choice. If God, if, if through Christ all these things were required, then how is that true love if we're almost being made to do it. Mm -hmm. Our Lord and Savior, you know, God's design and our Lord and Savior, these are choices that we are to make. That's where true love is found, is in the choice, not in being told you have to. Amen. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's why I will not tell you that you are required. If you go to God because you're required, I don't think it's going to do you much good. You go to humbly ask, 
to go before him, to worship him, to honor and praise him, because you want to. Okay. Big difference. You're right, Steve. Yeah. Um, so, ne ne next week, Lord willing, uh, we'll get to Brother Richard's uh, other two questions of how, how do we fast, and when should we fast, and again, we'll look at maybe uh, if fasting is just an individual activity. My closing comments are, when we worship God in spirit and in truth, we are not there out of compulsion, which Steve was just saying. Not because we have to, because it is a requirement that we must fulfill. It is done out of our love, appreciation, and awe of God. Out of our desire to please our first love. I have found fasting to be a great help in separating me from this world when I need to be, and all its cares, and into the spirit where I must be to worship God. Should we fast? You are free to decide. You must answer for yourselves. And God had his blessing. Yeah. I was going to say that study made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. We'll look forward to the second part. Um, just a reminder again, we have an elder deacon meeting tomorrow night. And, uh, uh, two weeks till we celebrate uh, our Christmas service uh, on Sunday, so we look forward to that. I'm going to ask you to stand, and uh, we're going to sing 455. Uh, 442, I think it was. 442? Yeah, 442. Does anything to do with fasting? <laughs> it has with walking? Yes. Walking with him. Go for it,
hearts in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we once again humbly come and we bow before you, Father, acknowledging thee as the giver of every good and perfect gift, the giver of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and life we have in him, and the giver of life itself to all that has breath. Father, we acknowledge thee. Father, we thank you for this time as you know as well. Our spirits are willing, but our flesh is weak. We thank you, Father, that in your precious word you show us how, how we who are so prone to wander and to drift away from you, how we can train ourselves to keep coming back to you, ways that will keep you ever before our minds, keep us doing the things that we desire to do for you. So Father, we thank you for Brother Richard's question. We thank you for your, your precious words and, and, and guidance. We thank you for the example of that perfect one, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one that we desire to emulate and, and follow, following in his footsteps and allowing you to do your work to change us daily more into the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Father, we do thank you for this time and we ask all these things and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.